I don't have to approve. Because if I don't approve, if I don't approve with the way Jesus did it, I promise you I don't approve with the way I'm seeing some people do it. But the fact that I look at Jesus and go, man, anger is a powerful thing. You use it right. Lord, teach me how to use it right. And teach me to understand the people that are using it that I don't understand. And I don't mean they're right. Teach me to at least ask the question that you asked Cain. Because God walks in the garden and goes, Cain, why are you angry? Not Cain, anger's wrong. No. Hey, why are you angry? You know what might happen? We might facilitate some conversations we need to have in the American church. Hey, why are you mad at us? Why are you mad at us? And then stop defending your position. Just listen. People need to get some stuff off their chest. That's okay. Here's what I've learned. Every criticism might just have one sliver of truth in it. So People criticize a sermon I preach, and it hurts. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like being criticized. I'm an easily wounded soul. I don't engage. Like social media, by like getting there and get Some people are you're engagers. God bless you. I, don't, I can't do it because I'll lay awake at night and think about stuff strangers that I don't even know saying stuff about me and I'm convinced that they're thinking about me all day long the reality is is they're never thinking about me they're not even thinking about me when they put that in that post they just ready to get something out so what I try to teach myself is take that criticism and realize that there might be one thing in there you could use if you would get off your offense horse there might be one thing in there you could have You could shape the way you say it. You could work a little harder. You're not trying to please everybody, and you're never going to do that anyway. But is there any area in there that's truth? So when we ask, why are you angry? Maybe we listen. Maybe we listen, and we don't agree with any of it. Listen, we don't agree with any of it. They're telling us why they're angry. We go, that's stupid. I don't agree with that. That's a lie. You've been watching that. And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll start ticking off all the reasons why everybody's wrong in their anger instead of listening for the one area that maybe, just maybe, We could do something. You know why we got to do it? Because God's not going to fix this. He's not riding in to go, all right, I'm I'm, I'm taking you out. I'm going to start killing people because that's kind of been the eschatology for a long time. I'm going to get rid of the good, faithful people. And then I'm going to go through there and I'm just going to level the world and let the devil run free for a while. And then when that's done, then we'll come in and finish this thing up. No, we're not spiraling downward towards Jesus coming to take care of things. We may be spiraling downward until we get broken and realize how to fix stuff. But our destiny is to share the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We have to. We're the last resort. You know what Pentecost is all about? It's the unity. There was no festival in the Hebrew calendar that used leaven, bread, leaven's mixture. They all used unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread. No mixture, no mixture, no mixture. Purity, purity, Israel only. Pentecost, leavened bread was the only feast. Why? Bring them together. Jews, Gentiles, white, black, didn't matter. The power of the Holy Spirit, bring them together. The unity of the church is not that we all agree. The unity of the church is that we can all fly under the same banner. And his name is Jesus and his job is love. Walking that out. What a thing. Genesis 4, verse 7. Okay, we're technically about halfway done with this sermon. And that's that's not, that's not where. All right, I'm not going to do that to you, but we're going to speed up a little bit. I actually jumped ahead a little bit from earlier. You're so, you guys are so easy to preach to. You and you got me saying stuff I I don't want to say. Like, I'm, I'm coming out with stuff going, eh, you, you're probably going to, you need to edit that out. See, I'm already making mental marks up here looking at the clock going, at that point, edit the next eight minutes. So you leave that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I may leave it in there. Uh, Genesis 4, 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. We got a little ahead of ourselves here talking about sin and original sin. This is the text we were talking about. Sin lies at your door. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. So here's what he does. He gets asked, why are you mad? 
Why is your accountant falling? You got an opportunity to fix this. So Cain goes to talk to his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. This is one of the more tragic moments in the Bible. And I don't want to oversell it, but I think Genesis 4-9 is the turning point of the Bible. I think the whole Bible is built on Genesis 4-9. Most preachers will tell you that the biblical narrative is, is the redemption story built upon Adam and Eve's fall leading up to the new Adam. I don't disagree, but I kind of disagree. I mean, I don't disagree enough to go, no, that's not scriptural. For me, the way I see the Word, the Bible, the theme of what the Word's trying to create in the earth starts in Genesis 4-9. The Lord says to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And Cain's response I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Where is Abel, your brother? I don't know. He's, is he my responsibility? Notice Cain asks a question back to God. Cain's the first one to flip that back to the Father. God doesn't say in the next verse, yes or no. Instead, God lays out 66 books of the Bible. Pop, 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 all the way to the end, and the answer is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. So for me, the Bible starts in Genesis 4-9. Am I my brother's keeper? You bet you are. And the one thing you're going to argue about is, who's my brother? Or who's my neighbor? Because it's going to show your heart has never really been compassionate for Abel. You've never really dealt with your anger over Abel. You've never really dealt with your anger over yourself or with God. As long as your brother's your enemy. As long as your brother's isolated. As long as your neighbor's forgotten. You want to know why Israel was judged under the Old Covenant? It was not because Israel committed... Listen, there was sacrifice for individual sin. If you went out here and you're an Israelite in the, in the Old Testament and you fail... You could go buy a, a lamb and bring it to the tabernacle and sacrifice it and your sin be covered. God provided for individual sin. So why do they keep getting kicked out of the promised land and overtaken by foreign armies throughout the Old Testament? And we'll go, because they kept sinning. What sin was it? Because He gave them sacrifice for all the other sins. What sin was it that got them kicked out of the land? Every time it was the same one. They ignored the stranger and the widow and the fatherless and the poor. And once that happened, God said, you're out. Jesus comes along and his message is to the stranger and the widow and the fatherless and the poor. So much that it ruins his public reputation. He keeps eating with the wrong people. He keeps loving the wrong people. He keeps caring for the wrong people. What do I mean by wrong people? They're not the in crowd. They're not the majority. They're not the mainstream. They're not the accepted. They're the outcast, the minority. They're the backward. They're the hurting. They're the hopeless. You get to the end of the prophetic calendar in Matthew 24, 25. You get into Matthew 25 after the day of the Lord, and, and Jesus says, and let me tell you how this is all going to come down. My Father's going to divide the goats from the sheep. And then he explains what that is. He goes, it's nations. My Father's going to judge nations. And you know what that judgment's going to be? That they saw someone in need and didn't help them. And they're going to say to me in that day, Lord, when did we ever see anybody? When did we ever see you in need and not help you? And he says, if you do it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Even in Revelation in the New Jerusalem, and I don't care where you think that is. I personally think you are the New Jerusalem, but some people think it's a city on the way. Okay, maybe we're both wrong. Maybe we're both right. doesn't really matter. The, what matters is the principle of the New Jerusalem. There's gates, but they're not closed. Why are they not closed? Because there's people on the outside that need what you have on the inside. And they get to come in, and you know what's happening inside? There are leaves next to the tree of life on trees, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. People can consume the goodness that you see in Jesus, and they can have what you have in Jesus for time and eternity. That's why I don't think this thing goes down to where there's no one that ever needs. I know we've got an idea that someday there'll be a place where no one ever needs. No, the Bible ends with the gates open because people need 
What it tells me is get ready. You're going to live in a world with need. And you're the solution to the need. You're the answer to the need. You're what the world needs in this hour. There is so much that's, that's, that's bubbling in my soul this weekend. And so much bubbling in my soul this morning. I feel like I've taken you down 15 roads. Like... You know how your GPS, you put in, I want to go to Atlanta, and then it tells you seven hours and 34 minutes. But then as you get to drive and you decide you need to go to New Orleans, which is completely the wrong way, and then you get done and you went like 18 hours. That's kind of how I feel like I've done this weekend with these sermons. Like, here's where we're going, and then way out here around. But I, I've found that some of the stuff that surfaces that the Holy Spirit works out in us, some of the stuff we walk away with will not even be what the heart of the sermon was. Like three weeks from now, you'll go, man, remember when he preached on this? And the reality is I didn't preach on that. I just spent a very productive 38 seconds over there, you know. But that's, I, I, I blame that on the Holy Spirit. I'll attribute that to the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to close with this text, all right? Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything. Church, this is what we got to do. You ready? Here we are on the earth. Paul's right near the end of his letter to the Romans. It's a tough letter. And then he drops this on them. Owe no one anything except to love one another. He who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Guess what? Not sinning is not the fulfillment of the law. Grace people go, well, you know how Jesus came and fulfilled the law? He never sinned. That's not how Jesus fulfilled the law. The fulfillment of the law was, if the fulfillment of the law was a never sin, then the law was given so you'd never sin, and then the law was a huge failure. The fulfillment of the law was not never sinning. The fulfillment of the law was loving people. How did Jesus fulfill the law? He loved people perfectly. He showed you how to love people. He showed you what it looked like. Here are the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. That's not all the commandments. But those are commandments that deal with each other. And if there's any other commandment, then they're all summed up in one saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't harm its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Hey, Cain, where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Love doesn't harm its neighbor. Love fulfills the law. Amen. Yes, Cain. Yes, yes, church. You are your brother's keeper. That was our sign to stop preaching.